Good morning, faithful listeners. You have tuned in to the P40 Ministries podcast, the one place where you can get a daily explanatory Bible reading to start your day strong. This is your host, Jen, bringing you a brand new episode out of Genesis. Hi, good morning, friends and faithful listeners. Thank you so much for tuning in this morning to the P40 Ministries podcast with Jen, the host, which is me. And so let's go ahead and read Genesis chapter 47, verses 13 through 31. We will finish out this chapter of the Bible this morning. So grab your Bible in whatever version you prefer, but I will be reading out the W.E.B. version this morning. There was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine. Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the grain which they bought, and Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. When the money was all spent in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in your presence? For our money fails." Joseph said to them, Give me your livestock, and I will give you food for your livestock, if your money is gone. They brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for the horses, and for the flocks, and for the herds, and for the donkeys, and he fed them with bread in exchange for all of their livestock for that year. When that year was ended, they came to him the second year, and said to him, We will not hide from my Lord how our money is all spent, and the herds of livestock are my Lord's. There is nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our lands. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for bread, and we and our land will be servants to Pharaoh. Give us seed, that we may live and not die, and that the land won't be desolate. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. For every man of the Egyptians sold his field, because the famine was severe on them, and the land became Pharaoh's. As for the people, he moved them into the cities from one end of the border of Egypt even to the other end of it. Only he didn't buy the land of the priests, for the priests had a portion from Pharaoh and ate their portion which Pharaoh gave them. That is why they didn't sell their land. Then Joseph said to the people, Behold, I have bought you and your land today for Pharaoh. Behold, here is seed for you, and you shall sow the land. It will happen at the harvests that you shall give a fifth to Pharaoh, and four parts will be your own, for seed of the field, for your food, for them of your households, and for food for your little ones. They said, You have saved our lives. Let us find favor in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. Joseph made it a statute concerning the land of Egypt to this day that Pharaoh should have the fifth. Only the land of the priests alone didn't become Pharaoh's. Israel lived in the land of Egypt, in the land of Goshen, and they got themselves possessions therein, and were fruitful and multiplied exceedingly. Jacob lived in the land of Egypt seventeen years. So the days of Jacob, the years of his life, were one hundred and forty-seven years. The time came near that Israel must die, and he called his son Joseph and said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, please put your hand under my thigh and deal kindly and truly with me. Please don't bury me in Egypt, but when I sleep with my fathers, you shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. Joseph said, I will do as you have said. Israel said, Swear to me, and he swore to him. Then Israel bowed himself on the bed's head. This entire chapter, minus the first portion of it that we talked about on um, Monday, is basically all about how smart Joseph really is and how he saved the entire nation of Egypt and also made Pharaoh, at that time, extremely wealthy. So basically, in verse 13, it says that there was no bread at all in the land. The famine was so severe, so much that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan fainted. So people were not able to produce crops anymore. People were so sick and so hungry and the land was laying desolate because nothing was growing. Perhaps there was no rain for almost seven years. Who knows how this famine took place? Perhaps locusts came through and devoured everything. I don't know how this famine came about. It doesn't say, but we do know that this was just a bad, bad famine. So bad that people were starving. So they all come to Joseph and they're basically like, how, 
why are you allowing us to die? We don't have any more money left. We can't buy this grain that you stored up in these storehouses. We need food, but we can't buy anything. So Joseph said to them, he's like, okay, well then I will take all of your uh, sheep and your herds and your cows and your donkeys and everything like that as payment for your grain this year. So that's what happened. The people were really happy with that statement. And they brought all of their animals to Joseph and they became Pharaoh's animals. And perhaps Joseph still allowed the people who had those animals to tend to them. But one way or the other, all of them now belong to Pharaoh. And for that entire year, because of that, Joseph ended up feeding the people in exchange for all of their animals and their livestock. So after that, it says that after that year had passed, the people were hungry again. They gathered to Joseph, all of these people, and probably not all the people of Egypt, but probably a good plenty of them came to Joseph to once again ask him for food for the entire year. Maybe it was like the mayors of each individual city or something like that or whatever they had back then. But one way or the other, all of these people gather to Joseph and they're like, look, you saved us last year by buying all of our livestock and all of our animals and stuff like that. And we appreciate that, but we're starving once again. And we know that there's still more grain here in Egypt. So here's what we want to do in exchange for that grain. And since we have no money, we will actually sell our land and sell ourselves to Pharaoh. And it says here in verse 19, he said, they say, why should we die before you, both we and our land? Buy us and buy our land in exchange for the grain. And we and our land will be servants to Pharaoh. And he says, they also say, please give us some seed so that we can actually start sowing the land again, start producing crops once again. So this was probably the end of the famine. I'm going to guess if they're asking for seeds from Pharaoh. Joseph as well. So they say, give us seed that we may live and not die and that the land won't be just desolate. Joseph agreed with them and he ended up buying up all of this land. It says that every single person who owned a land in Egypt sold their land to Pharaoh, every single person. And that is significant because now Pharaoh literally owns the entire nation of Egypt. (laughs) He doesn't just rule it. He now owns it. So Pharaoh became insanely, insanely wealthy pretty much within a couple years. And not only was he wealthy, but he also had so much power at this point. And it says that the people were pleased to do this because they were starving. Their families were starving. What good is their land if they have no food? If their land is unable to um, produce any crops, what good is it? They didn't want their land anymore. They wanted food. They wanted to survive. And so they came to Joseph with this proposition. So we can't get upset with Joseph thinking that Joseph took this land from these people to give it to Pharaoh. No, the people, it says directly that the people came to him with this proposition. They were happy to do this. They wanted this. They wanted food, of course. And Joseph was actually more than fair because it says here that not only did he buy the land, but he allowed these people who own this land to still continue to take care of it. And it says here that not only were they allowed to take care of it, but they could keep four-fifths of whatever they produced from that land. The other fifth belonged to Pharaoh. So they were still allowed to keep most of the crops they produced in that land. So this is more than fair. It wasn't like Joseph was just robbing them blind and taking every single thing they owned. No, he was still allowing them to um, keep the land and to till it and to harvest it and to plant on it and everything like that. It was just a fifth of it went to Pharaoh, almost like paying taxes. 20% went to Pharaoh and the rest went to the family members. Joseph said to the people in verse 23, I have bought you and your land today for Pharaoh. There, here's uh, some seed for you and sow in the land. So this, I'm guessing this is the end of the famine at this point. It says that when uh, the harvests happen, you shall give a fifth to Pharaoh, but the other four parts will be yours and yours alone um, for the seed of the field, your food and for your households and for food for your little ones. So he's being super fair. He is allowing these people to prosper still. He's allowing them to protect their families, to feed their families. But now these people just have to remember that their land 
basically belongs to Pharaoh and they can't really just do whatever they want on it anymore as much as they were allowed to before and also they have to basically pay a tax for um, for the food that they produce and they were so happy it says here in verse 25 they're like you have saved our lives and they're basically like thanking Joseph so much they're calling him my lord and they're saying you've saved our lives let us find favor in the sight of my lord and we will be Pharaoh's servants. They were so happy with this. They were happy to continue to survive and that Joseph was more than fair to them. So of course they were just very, very happy. And in verse 26, it ends up saying that um, when this book was written, it says that Joseph made it a statute concerning the land of Egypt to this day, which I'm guessing is um, when this book was written, that Pharaoh should have a fifth of the land. Only the land of the priests alone didn't become Pharaoh's. So basically the priests who were these um, these people who I'm guessing were basically magicians and stuff like that and priests of the Egyptian gods, they did not have to pay Pharaoh for their food. Pharaoh allotted them land and also gave them grain. So they didn't have to do any of that because they were priests. So basically the priests were allowed to keep their land, but every other Egyptian in the land who was a landowner gave that land to Pharaoh in exchange for food, basically. And you know what? I want to mention one thing. Uh, If you guys know anything about tithing, you know that tithing is meant to be 10% of your income basically goes to God. And God asks for 10%. And we often complain about that 10%. I know I do. I don't really like to tithe. It is not one of my favorite things to do. But when I was looking at this, I was kind of feeling a little bit guilty because Pharaoh asked for 20% of everything that the people made. And you know, if the people were happy with that and were happy that Pharaoh was allowing them to continue to live, why shouldn't we, and why shouldn't I, because I'm the one that's feeling the most guilty about this, why shouldn't I be happy to give 10% of what I make to God? God is the one that takes care of us. He's the one that provides for us. He's the one that shelters us. And yet we complain about giving 10% of what we make to God, or at least I do anyway. But so that was something I wanted to throw out there that it's just so ironic that these people were just so happy to give Pharaoh 20% of everything they made. And I complain about giving 10% of everything I make to God. (laughs) So that's a little bit of motivation for me to tithe more often, for sure. But anyway, moving forward in verse 27 to the end of the chapter, it says here that Israel lived in the land of Egypt. So Jacob lived in in Egypt, in the land of Goshen. And it says that they multiplied. Basically, they had lots of kids and grandkids and everything like that. And it says that Jacob lived in the land of Egypt for 17 years. So he didn't die right away. He was still... Um, He was very old when he came to the land of Egypt. He was 130 years old and he lived for another 17 years at this point. So he was 137 years old, I believe. I'm sorry, 147 years old when he died. And so he had a good long life left to live with his son, Joseph. I am sure he was so excited to be in Egypt and to be near to Joseph. But it says here that in verse 29, that the time came near that Israel must die. He called his son Joseph and said to him, If I have found favor in your sight, please put your hand under my thigh and deal kindly and truly with me. I don't know if you guys remember the episode I did a really a long time ago about putting the hand under the thigh. But that was something that was an ancient ritual, basically. The person who wanted something to be done for them would ask the recipient to put their hand under the thigh, which is the, the bottom part of the leg. And this was something that was very close. You know, if you have your hand under somebody's thigh, you're not going to um, probably likely lie to them at that point because you're going to feel very close to that person. It's going to be kind of awkward. And so this was an ancient ritual that they used to do with um, putting the hand under the thigh. So basically, Jacob asks Joseph to do this. He says, put your hand under my thigh and promise me that you are not going to bury me here in Egypt. I want to be buried where my father was buried, where Isaac and where Abraham were buried. Please carry me out of here when I die and let me rest with them is what it says. And Joseph promises. He says, yes, I will do that for you. 
And so this is a significant thing to think about because at this point, Jacob realizes that he is going to be going back to Canaan, to the land that was promised to him by God. And so he recognizes that he is the person that is going to continue the heritage of the Jewish nation. And this is why he asks Joseph to carry him out of Egypt because that is not where his family is going to be for very long. And so he says, carry me out of here and bury me there. And it says that Israel basically said, swear it to me. After Joseph was like, yes, I'll do that for you. Israel's like, swear it to me. And it says that Joseph swears it to him that he will not bury him in Egypt. And it says, then Israel bowed himself on the bed's head. So I don't know if that means he died. I'm going to guess no, he did not die at that exact moment or perhaps he did. But the reason I'm guessing no is because um, of the next chapter that we will talk about on Friday. So join me then at 6 a.m. But friends and faithful listeners, until then, happy listening and God bless.